Thanks, Joe. So you heard a talk before lunch about trying to persuade you the importance of taking all the tablets and not missing any. So I'm going to talk now about stopping the tablets. So I wouldn't want you to think that there's a sort of war going on with Hammersmith saying you must take tablets and up north we try and stop them. It's not like that at all. As I, hope that, I hope you realise that. Early on, take the tablets, but later on, can you stop? So that's the question that we're going to try, I'm going to try and address here when I work out how to do this. Um, do, I do it on this thing? Okay, fine. So, yeah, so I, I was a bit late arriving, unfortunately, there's strike action on North Western Railways today, uh, so only every other train is running. So, um, w but some of you will have heard me speak, or others speak at earlier versions of this meeting, about the notion that CML is a kind of inverted iceberg. So you know the iceberg is a little bit of ice sticking up, but there's an awful lot underneath the surface that can sink the Titanic and so on. And CML is a little bit the opposite, where you see an awful lot of disease in the blood at diagnosis, but in a way what we're uh, interested in more than that is this bit below the surface. Is there a pointer somewhere? Ah, there we are. Um, it, 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 one's interested in this bit below the surface here, um, and the way that this uh, is eroded with treatment, say that at the start we have something like a trillion cells, 10 to the 12, 12 is a very big number. But then treatments, and, and yes, patients are often surprised to know that if we could somehow magic those leukemia cells all into one place in the body, it would be about the size of a rugby ball. So it's not surprising people don't feel terribly well when they're diagnosed. But with treatment we've had for 50 years, we can get the blood count back to normal. And that but that's only really reducing the leukemia by a log, by about 90%. So there's still an awful lot of leukemia left. Um, and uh, now the leukemia is about the size of a grapefruit. Is that about, you can get 10 grapefruits into a rugby ball? I suppose that's about right, isn't it? And I'd allow up to three months, although I'd really like to see the blood back to normal in four to six weeks. But let's go on. Let's take another... 90% of the disease away. Now we're down to 10 to the 10 cells, so it's still a huge number, but now the bone marrow is clear, and we call that complete cytogenetic remission. And these days we don't bother to do bone marrows to, to test for that, because you can uh, make a pretty good um, correlation with just doing the PCR result, and that correlates to about 1%. Now, how long would we want that to happen? Well, I think that's about the size of a walnut, 10 walnuts in a, a grapefruit, I suppose so. Uh, and I'd allow up to 12 months. Sometimes it happens quicker than that, but 12 months is fine. But let's keep going. Let's go down another log. We now have three logarithms from where we started with, and that, this level of response is called MR3, molecular response to level three. I'm going to call it major molecular response for the rest of the talk, because I think uh, that's a fairly familiar, bit old-fashioned way of speaking about it, but then I'm old too. This might be equivalent to a grain of rice, and that might take perhaps 18 months. But the point I want to make, really, is that this is essential. I would worry if someone doesn't get to this level. This is nice extra, but I've got plenty of patients who are somewhere between there, and we could have a jolly good debate, I suspect, with the, the medics in the room about whether it's actually important, or crucial to get to this level, and I think there'd be a difference of opinion. But I think where we'd agree is that getting down to the next level, MR4, may be not that important. This would be, I don't know, it's a grain of, a sand, a grain of sand sort of size, but I don't know if this is important. Although many patients achieve it, if you're one of the patients that are somehow stuck here and don't get down to there, this is certainly still compatible with a completely normal uh, uh, life expectancy and, and outcome. So these, these increasingly low levels are less and less important, I think. Right, that's the background, because I, I wanted to explain that, because it's quite important to explain uh, some of the important ideas behind stopping treatment. Now, the stopping story starts with this study called STIM. Lots of stirs there. STIM is an acronym from the French group who did a trial of stopping imatinib, so it's called STIM. And this was run, began in 2006, and I won't go through the design, which is a little bit involved here, but the general idea is that patients have treatment for some years, and then there's a two-year observation period with lots of tests, and provided these in this study were negative, um, then patients stop treatment, and there's frequent molecular testing, as you see with all these arrows here. So that was STIM, 
And the results are shown here, where two, two things are quite important. The first thing is that a few patients went wrong. So we start with 100% of patients. After six months of, of stopping, uh, uh, there's been a lot of people who've lost their response and had to resume treatment. And very few people lose their response if they're fine at six months. The second thing is, at 24 months, which I'm going to ask you to remember all the 24-month figures because they become important, at 24 months, 38% of people, so slightly less than half, uh, are still fine off treatment. It's important to remember that STIM is only looking at people who've had very good responses down to MR4, and MR4 was about the level of detection at the time the trial was done. So these are, I was going to say very good patients, I don't mean that, these are patients with very good responses. They're not good patients or bad patients, that's the wrong way to think of it. <coughs> Um, that's a bit technical, but the, one of the problems with STIM is that they were very um, uh, cautious about uh, people whose PCR levels rose. And many of us have seen when, that when treatment stops, the PCR level may rise, but that may not matter. So a number of uh, people uh, have, uh, and this, this was actually a rerun of STIM, it was called uh, A-STIM, according to STIM, but running exactly the same trial, but now saying, well, we're not, going to have a, we're not going to worry about a PCR that becomes positive, only if it goes above 0.1%, only if we lose MMR, are we going to call that a recurrence. And you can see the results are now much better. So around 24 months, the figure is around 60%, something like that. Okay, so that's using, a, if you like, the up-to-date way of defining recurrence. And this is a very big study called Euroski, which has run more or less the same time as our, our own British study of destiny um, uh, across many European countries, um, and this is their result. And you see at 24 months of stopping treatment, the figure is 52% of people are, uh, are fine. And there's very few events beyond 24 months. This is slightly out of date now. It's been published properly, and the, the line just continues pretty well straight uh, for an, an, another couple of years, which is when the trial ended. So once again, you see the majority of the events are happening early on in those first six months. <clears throat> now, we were asked uh, about six years ago whether we'd like to take part in Euroski. So it's the sort of opposite version of Brexit, really, that this is something we weren't in and we were being asked to join. And we had a meeting in Glasgow in uh, Professor Copeland's lab. Um, uh, th there were a couple of other meetings, but this was the definitive one. And the feeling there was that, well, okay, all these studies have looked at this group of patients who are, uh, have very good responses. Of course, there are patients here who barely get into complete cytogenetic remission, and no one in their right mind would recommend stopping treatment in such a patient, because although they may do very well, coming off treatment, there's a very high chance that the disease would get active again, and that's not good. But there's an intermediate group of people who make it into MMR without any problems, but get stuck. And we know that this group of patients can do extremely well, in, will do extremely well in the long term, but no one's ever tried stopping treatment in those patients. And anecdotally, we all had one or two patients where we had stopped treatment, perhaps for pregnancy reasons or a nasty side effect or something, and nothing very much happened. So let's look at that properly. And the other thought was that if we go back to the Euroski data or any other data, Okay, 50%, 52% is great, but there's a lot of people here who are not well served by stopping. But what would happen if they went on to a lower dose? Because they might feel an awful lot better because of side effects or improvement in side effects, um, uh, even if they can't completely stop. So let's try and look at that in some way as well. So in my sort of Brexit analogy, we decided that it was all very well in Europe and it was going to be very interesting, but we didn't quite want to take part. We wanted to sort of almost take part. Uh, in other words, we wanted to have the same entry criteria so we could compare the results, but we wanted to add on a couple of extra things so we could try and address what about patients who aren't, don't have quite such deep responses and what about if we reduce the dose before we actually stop. So that led to the design of DESTINY, and DESTINY is simply an acronym for de-escalation, which means halving the dose, basically, and stopping treatment of imatinib, nilotinib, or dasatinib. That's the trade name for dasatinib, but I needed a Y to make the acronym. <laughs> <coughs> so that was destiny. And these are the en entry criteria. They're, they're not all the entry criteria. They're all quite formal, and I'm not going to plough through these. But just to make a couple of points, that 
all the studies, including ours, have only looked at people in first chronic phase. So if somebody has gone into advanced phase, accelerated phase, or blast crisis, and then been successfully treated with a transplant or some other means of treatment back into another chronic, a second chronic phase, no one has ever studied stopping in those patients, and nor have we. So if someone was in that situation, I think we were in unknown territory about stopping. So that's the first point. And the second point is that actually this was deliberate, that the inclusion for the MR4 patients, the patients with the very deep responses, is pretty well exactly the same as in Euroski. And that means we can then analyse our results against Euroski much more uh, uh, um, rigorous, um, objectively. But we also included this new group of patients who are not quite so deep responses. And here's the design shown as a picture. There's a year of half-dose treatment, the de-escalation phase, and there are the actual doses. And then, provided everything's fine, two years of stopping treatment, and that takes us out to uh, basically a three-year study. The only odd thing is this awkward period just after the stopping phase where we have to wait for that result to come through, which takes somewhere between two and, two and four weeks. So operationally, it's 37 weeks, but functionally, it's, it's 36 and for the first time, the first time I've presented these data, where I'm able to say the study is now complete, because the very last patient from this very city uh, had his last visit on the 11th of June. And we have actually got his results. So I can show you the results of all the patients now, probably for the first time. No, definitely for the first time. Um, what happened? Well, an awful lot of pa patients were very interested in this, and those of you who've been to these meetings over many years will know that uh, probably six, five years ago, six years ago, something like six years ago it must have been at this meeting, there was an awful lot of enthusiasm from patients, and that actually was very persuasive to the people that fund and approve these things, to have such a powerful patient voice and a patient opinion that was driving for this study to take place. So that was very important. So immense patient interest, 335 patients screened, but quite a lot of patients weren't eligible, either because their PCRs technically weren't, um, uh, didn't fit the criteria, which was probably in hindsight quite rigged, a little bit too rigorous, or because when they found out that there would be such frequent monthly visits to do the PCR tests, and they'd have to come to the main sites doing the study, so for some of my uh, patients from northwest Wales, let's say, that would be a round trip of 200 miles just to have a blood test. And we couldn't farm those out to the various local hospitals, um, so that was a deterrent for some patients. And some people just began to realise that they actually felt quite a sense of security from taking those tablets each day, and they didn't actually want to stop after all. So 174 patients actually went in the study. The majority were this MR4 group that had been studied in, in all the other studies, but here's this novel 49 patient group of patients with responses that are very good but not uh, as good. Um, this is how we describe the patients, and please don't look at any of the detail of this, but I was just too lazy. I should have really just put this in a single slide. The point here is that almost all the patients, 85% in destiny, have only ever had imatinib. 6% uh, had had uh, dasatinib, and these were almost all patients who'd been in that SPIRIT2 trial you heard about a moment ago and completed the five-year follow-up and then wanted to stop. And a few patients similarly on nilotinib from earlier studies as well. So it's almost an entirely an imatinib study, but not completely. And this is what happened to the patients. This is the traditional way of plotting it. Um, so we start with 174 patients in two groups, the MMR, MR4 and the MMR group, and some patients lose their response. Some patients come off the study for all sorts of perfectly good reasons. Uh, there was one pregnancy here. There's one uh, gentleman who felt that when it got to ending de-escalation, he felt quite happy. His side effects had gone away and he didn't want to stop. So he has to come out and study for the, the formal uh, rigour of, of the study design. And this is pretty normal numbers. In fact, it's quite low numbers of people coming out to study. And then people go forward to stop and the same sort of thing happens and uh, uh, a, a few recurrences. Well, let me show you the recurrences in a bit more detail pictorially. So I guess by now you're familiar with these uh, sort of outcome curves. You start with 100% of patients here and you ask the question about recurrence. This isn't survival, uh, thank goodness. Uh, this is recurrence. And let's just look at the red line first. So this is the MR4 patients that were in, in all the other studies. 
And during this first year of half-dose treatment, almost nothing happens. There's 125 patients and three patients lose their response. So 98% of people are just fine and eligible to stop. But when people stop, just the same as the other studies, we've seen a lot of events in the first six months and then very few after that. And we end up at that 24-month stopping point that you've been memorising from all the other studies with 72% of people. So this is actually a lot better than the other studies. 50% in Euroski that I showed you, uh, barely 60% in one or two of the other studies. No one's ever got this sort of result. So 72% is actually world-beating. <coughs> Uh, what about the, M MR uh, sorry, the MMR group? So these are patients with not quite such deep responses. Well, they're certainly not disasters, but there are more recurrences, as you see. So during this initial year of half-dose treatment, uh, there were nine recurrences out of 49, and that means there's 81% of people make it through the half-dose treatment, and then a number of more events in the first six months once again, but still 36% of the number we started with are, being a, are able to come off treatment. So this means that stopping treatment isn't a completely daft idea. It's not a dangerous thing to do in uh, patients in only MMR. And that's also, I think, practice changing. Uh, the dogma out there is that this shouldn't be attempted uh, in patients who are only in MMR. And I would not support that anymore with the results of this trial. Of course, patients have to be motivated, have to want to stop. It's not something that doctors should be saying, well, you've got to stop, we need to save some money. You, you can't do it like that. But if the patient is keen to stop for all sorts of good, normal reasons, then that's perfectly reasonable. Um, well, can we predict who are the patients who are going to have recurrences? And I only got these, this information on Thursday, so it's a little bit unsorted out yet. But the longer you've been on treatment, the lower the chance of recurrence. <laughs> But it's not quite as simple as that because no one had been on treatment for less than three years because if you were, you couldn't get in the trial. And the longest patient was 11 and a bit years, I think, on treatment. <laughs> um, and it's not linear. Now, what do I mean by that? It's not as if you buy an extra 8% 8 8 of uh, success uh, for each additional year. So you can't say, well, I think I want to put it up by 4.5%, so I'll have an extra 6 and a bit months. It's not linear like that at all. In fact, the way the information looks, it seems that there's a cutoff at about seven years. People who have had less than seven years have quite a, sh a, a higher risk of recurrence than people who've been on treatment for longer than seven years. But I deliberately didn't put that on the slide because that's over the trial as a whole. And it might well be that in people who are in MR4, you don't need seven years. But if you are in MMR, so not quite as good, you do need longer treatment. And that's what we haven't quite sorted out yet. So this is a sort of hot off the press, and uh, we need to look at that in a bit more detail. And it wouldn't surprise me if people who haven't got quite such deep remissions need more treatment time to get a good result. So we'll have that, I, I suspect, in the next month or so. What doesn't make a difference, and this is quite clear, is it doesn't matter how old you are. We've had some uh, uh, many recurrences in the younger patients and some very good results in the older ones, and vice versa. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, the patients fare exactly the same. It doesn't matter how fit you are, judged by something called a performance status. Um, uh, it doesn't matter which drug you were on, um, uh, whether it's imatinib, dasatinib, or nilotinib. We don't have any basutinib or ponatinib patients in here for, for, uh, ver simply because there's so, so few patients who've only ever had those drugs. The scoring system doesn't seem to make any difference, not, for, not, not in a sense that you could use in the clinic. And the, number, sorry, the length of time people have had good deep remissions doesn't seem to be important either, which was a little bit of a surprise. So these don't seem to matter. Um, what happens if people do get a recurrence? And I think I could say that everybody goes back to MMR and often a lot better than that when they resume treatment at full dose. The reason I that isn't 100% is that there were six people of the 64 who had um, uh, a recurrence who decided that they wouldn't go back on full dose treatment because they felt so good on half dose treatment and that means that that's absolutely fine but that means they have to formally come out of the trial so I can't plot them on this curve but we know anecdotally because we rang up the sites that all six of those patients have actually been fine. So I can say informally that everybody uh, was fine. Though we can't actually say that in 
print, although I'll, I'll, I'll find a fudge to, to get around that. Um, I think I'll skip that in the interest of time. Do people feel better on treatment? Well, those two slides I skipped were the various questionnaires that those of you in the trial will have filled in diligently every month. And they weren't a waste of time, but it turns out that the questionnaires are a little bit too insensitive to try and pick up side effects of people who are doing very well in CML on TKIs, because these questionnaires were really designed for across cancer and picking up the side effects of much more intensive chemo. So it wasn't that they were a waste of time, but essentially the, rep the reports that patients were giving were of normal quality of life on those instruments. Now, we know quality of life is not 100%, and this was much more interesting. These are the diaries that patients themselves filled in as well at the same time. And what people were asked to do was to report any symptoms that they'd had, either new ones or how did the, the ones that you reported last time, how have they fared? And it's a bit complicated, but let me take you through this sort of dartboard effect. You start here with this wedge here. These are the MR4 patients, and uh, this orange segment here, that's lethargy, that's feeling tired. The yellow is feeling nauseated. The blue is uh, the eye swelling that is common with imatinib, and the various things. By month three, so this is now on half-dose treatment for three months, these some symptoms are going down. These are the number of people reporting those symptoms, and they're going down. Don't really change then until we get to 12 months, which is here, and then people are stopping, and you can see a further improvement. And that's perhaps even more dramatic in the MMR patients shown on the left here. So patients, as reported by patients, not by uh, the bias of nurses or doctors, patient-reported symptoms are actually improving. Just a couple of final things. Um, People who have stopped treatments are quite uh, uh, prone to this uh, so-called musculoskeletal symptoms, which was first identified in the Uriski study. And essentially what they found is that about 30% of people are reporting some sort of symptom along the bottom here. Arthralgia means painful joints. Myalgia means painful muscles. Lumbalgia, I think, must mean pain painful lower backache, um, and, and so on. So any of these symptoms were grouped together as musculoskeletal symptoms, and about 30% of people are reporting those symptoms. We tried to get a bit more information on that within Destiny, and it actually proved to be quite difficult, partly because people are getting aches and sprains all the time. Uh, you know, that's everyday life, nothing to do with CML or its treatment. So uh, it, it's hard to divorce that out from what may be happening here. And, and partly because some symptoms are really rather vague and may improve but not completely go away, and we didn't have a very sophisticated, a sophisticated way of, of dealing with that. And partly, certainly two of my own patients, they already had rheumatoid arthritis. So how do you deal with that? Because that's a disease that waxes and wanes anyway, and imatinib and CML won't make a difference to that. Um, so you've got this background to sort out, and I, we haven't really got very far with that, and I'm a bit pessimistic that we will. But what I can say is within Destiny, the figure's pretty well the same. It's about a third of patients the, this is a real thing that is undoubtedly occurring. It may persevere for several months. It's benign. When people have gone to joint specialists, lots of tests are usually done, and they're all normal, and the joint specialists uh, are fascinated, and then over a period of months, they gradually lose interest, particularly as the symptoms get better. Um, so in a way, I'm not sure that joint, referral, joint specialist referrals are particularly useful. What does help is a short course of steroids if people are really in trouble. Um, Brufen and those sorts of things are not terribly useful um, uh, 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 in large. And the outlook is in general benign, although I know that some patients have had trouble going on for a year or more. <clears throat> I think we'll perhaps skip these other studies. Just a, a few questions then we've, we've got from stopping studies. Well, these were the questions I set out up actually about five years ago when we opened the study as, as questions we try and answer from the study. Do people feel better? Well, I think we can say yes because I've shown you the data. Um, how many people don't go into stopping studies and why is that? It's very difficult to know about this because what happens in the clinic is that somebody might say, well, do you fancy going into a study of stopping treatment? And the patient says no. Well, no one's going to record that very accurately and send it off to a, a, a trial centre. So we don't really know. But my guess is about 20% of people probably don't feel comfortable with stopping, even though it would be quite safe to think about it. <clears throat> and that's fine. Can some people who stop 
uh, manage, so, sorry, some people who relapse and have to go back onto treatment, can they manage on lower doses? We didn't look at that in the trial, but I know anecdotally that that seems to be fine. Um, as long as people are back in MMR, what's happened in many cases, people have gone back onto that lower dose and all is well. Um, is it essential to have really deep remissions? MR 4.5, which I didn't show you on my inverted iceberg, but that's a, a half a level lower still. It's about as low as we can get with the PCR assays. And it doesn't seem to make a difference. We have looked at that in Destiny, and those who are really, really deep don't seem to do any better or worse than people who are, uh, than the other patients. Um, and one of the studies I didn't show you a moment ago uh, sort of endorses that. So it's not essential to be really, really low before you stop. What's the minimum safe time? We don't really know. No one's really studied anyone who's been on treatment for less than three years. So less than three years, that's not long enough you need to continue. Quite how long after that? Well, maybe when I look at the results from Thursday in a bit more detail, I can give a rather more sensible comment about that. Um, are hairs more... Uh, uh, able to stop successfully than tortoises. Well, I'm not sure if this idea of hares and tortoises has cropped up earlier on. Hares are patients who take their treatment and within uh, a week the blood's normal and within a month the PCR is 1% and within three months it's 0.1% and within six months it's undetectable. There are the hares, they've charged off, excellent response, and of course that's very good news. But the tortoise is, blood count gradually settles down, come back to the clinic, the PCR is a bit lower, People start scratching their heads, is this working, come back again, the PCR is a bit lower still. Gradually the point is that people get there but they may take a year or 18 months to get to MMR. There the tortoise is. Are the hairs really any better? And I think for general responses there's no evidence that they really are. But for this we don't really know. But we've got some friends in Dresden that uh, Do uh, Professor Copeland uh, introduced me to recently. We've sent all the data off to them. These are mathemat mathematicians who are interested in modelling leukaemias uh, mathematically. So this is actually quite nice and relatively easy for them to do. So they've got our data, they're happy with the data, and they promise that we'll, that we'll have an answer before Christmas or that sort of time. So it will be very interesting to know that. There's a little bit of science tacked on to destiny, much of which hasn't been completed yet. Uh, various things, uh, as you see here. We've looked at, at just at our own patients within Liverpool as, as to whether there's something that we can easily measure in the immune system that might be altering. Uh, can we predict from the immune system who's going to have a recurrence or not? And the short answer in our humble 38 patients is it's nothing very easily measurable is making any difference. So uh, nothing very obvious. Well, what we're we going to do next, ladies and gentlemen, we've got some names. You can see here uh, there's a large selection of possible names for an, the next trial. There's just one problem, and that is I think it's extremely unlikely there's going to be another destiny-sized trial to look at stopping, at least. Um, and the reason for that is that this costs £1.3 million, pounds, and we've already got some very good answers. So we've now got an excellent success rate, 72% in those MR4 patients, um, how could you justify spending £1.3 million on almost a success story? Um, but if one were to, to want to know inform more information, I, I would want to know what would happen if you, you de-escalated, if you cut the dose down more gently. Um, in other words, not going straight to half-dose treatment and not just for a year, maybe going on longer. And it's interesting that our friends in Moscow, in Russia, are quite keen to develop this idea. So they're talking about, when I saw them in June... They're talking about going down to say to patients, don't take your drug at the weekends. So that's, if you like, going from seven to five days a week. And then after a few months or maybe a year saying, only take your drug at weekends. So then going on to two days a week and then eventually stopping. So that would be a, a little bit more gradual than what we've done, although in a different way. Full dose, but not for every day of the week. Um, and there are various other permutations you could think about, and you know, some will be more scientifically sensible than others, but uh, I, I would like to see more information on exactly this, because undoubtedly patients can manage on lower doses, but the best way of managing on a lower dose, uh, we don't quite know. Um, probably what I wouldn't want to stop a patient's treatment is people who haven't actually made it to stable MMR. So those... Forgot, forgotten what colour, that top line, that top wavy line of people who are barely in CCR is, is not suitable for uh, um, stopping. 
not in first chronic phase, I think that would just be too risky, and, as, and not patients who haven't been in stable remissions for a while. Uh, right, I think I'll just skip that and end up by acknowledging a large number of patients, some of whom are in the audience, uh, who've taken part in this, and the 20 teams, including my own, who've taken part in the study. And the people who funded this, we've had a small grant from Bloodwise, um, uh, which is the modern name for the Leukemia Research Fund, whose old logo was much nicer than the present one, I must say. Um, and also, thanks to my good friend, Francois Xavier Mahon, in Bordeaux, who originated the STEM study and has been a very useful source of advice and uh, encouragement along the way. Thank you.